All right, so thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name's Rachel Ball, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest for this evening, V. Neal. She's had a legendary career as a multi-academy award-winning makeup artist in Hollywood, and she was responsible for some of the most iconic visuals that we saw in Beetlejuice, as well as in her amazing reel just now. So please join me in warmly welcoming V. Neal. <laughs> So I thought I might start by asking you, how did you first become involved with the Beetlejuice Project? Um, I was doing a film called The Lost Boys, and um, the production designer, Bo Welch, came to me and he said, V, said, I just read the script and got this job on this movie called Beetlejuice with this new director, um, and I thought you'd be perfect for the job. And I said, well, you know, find out who's on the production staff. Maybe I know somebody I can make a phone call. And I just basically started that way. I, uh, Start, found out who the production manager was, and it just happened to be a guy who I'd worked with on the movie 9 to 5. He was the first AD on that movie. So I started calling him up and pestering the heck out of him and saying, you've got to get me in there. i got to go talk to this weird guy, Tim Burton. And <laughs> because nobody really knew who he was at that point. You know, he had done his two small films, and then he had done you know, the Pee Wee movie, but he still was relatively unknown. So... Um, I said, yeah, let me, get, let me get in there and talk to him. And, and finally I got a, he said, okay, now it's time. But I was pestering the heck out of him, basically. So Squeaky I, wheel, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so how was it like negotiating, working with Tim Burton on Beetlejuice, a director who famously draws all of his own concept art, um, and sort of negotiating your own creative process alongside that? Well, um, it, it kind of started like this. Uh, as you walked into the, this little production trailer that we had, and literally we were on the back lot at um, the studio over in Culver City, and we were basically the you know, redheaded stepchildren of Warner Brothers at that point. It was a David Geffen film. They didn't want anything to do with us. They didn't even let us shoot on the Warner Brothers lot. And they stuck us over in this crappy little trailers. And <clears throat> there was this cork board up on the wall as you walked into this production trailer and had these little rickety sketches up there. And he had a sketch of what he thought Beetlejuice would look like. And he basically looked like a derelict. It was just a little black and white pencil sketch, you know? So when it came time to do Michael's test, I, took the, I said, let me, let me take a picture of the sketch. I took a Polaroid at that point, because that's what we used. And um, I went back to the trailer and I did Basically, what I saw in the drawing, which he just based, he looked like a derelict, and it was just you know nothing. And I brought him back. I brought pictures back, and he goes, "Oh no, he just looks too awful. Nobody wants to look at him. He's you know he's not very appealing." And I'm going, "Yeah, well, <laughs> he's not very appealing in the sketch." And so he said, "Well, just try something different." So I went back, and and I didn't really know Tim's aesthetic at this point. So <clears throat> I went back and did another rendition. Still wasn't right. And I said. Okay, so I tell you what, I said, why don't I just take him back to the trailer and let me do what I want to do with him? Because at this point, we had already had a conversation about what we wanted the rest of the afterlife to look like. They were all supposed to be like pastel colors, and we realized pastel was a little too pale, so we did them a little darker. But I thought, we will have one pastel-looking guy, and it'll be Beetlejuice. And so we went back to the trailer, and I made him this really pale, pale yellow, almost white, and I think by this time, the hairdresser had probably dyed that wig we had probably about a half a dozen times, and it was starting to look really awful. And I said, now it's starting to look good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I said to the guy I was working with, um, oh, first of all, Michael said, hey, you guys. He said, you know, I don't want to look like myself. I, he said, can you give me like a broken nose or something? And I said, uh, yeah, sure, I, we could probably sculpt something. And, he, and I said to Steve, I said, do you have any broken noses in your bag of tricks at home? Because he had done a lot of little bits and pieces of stuff. And he says, no, but he said, I have these swollen lips. We can put you know, one, the top one on this side and the bottom one on this side, and we'll just make his look, nose look crooked. And I said, OK. He says, I have some with me. So we put him on, and we made his nose crooked with these two swollen lips. And that's basically what we used the entire film. <laughs> And you know, we put a bald cap on him and painted him pale yellow. And in the meantime, I had sent off uh, one of the PAs to a hobby store. And I said, get me some ground up foam, like you use on those uh, model kits, you know? And get me like three different colors of green and some moss and stuff. And I said, I'm just going to make him look like he crawled out from underneath a rock and see if this works for him. Because he does pop up out the ground. And 
yada yada, and he doesn't really have to look like anybody else because they all have something wrong with him anyway. And um, <clears throat> so I did it, and Tim went, that, that's fantastic. Because he wanted him to look creepy, but he wanted him to be funny, and we wanted to be able to look at him through the whole movie, so we had to figure out, you know, all these different things that would work that would make him, you know, you'd want to look at him more. You know, and of course, we gave him bad teeth. Steve made some teeth for him. And I actually had my manicures come, and I made Michael wear those fingernails for two and a half weeks. <laughs> so um, he was walking around with those nasty fingernails on, because I didn't want, he was so active and crazy, I didn't want him popping off and us having to deal with it all the time. So we just put acrylic nails on him. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned um, trying to find that perfect balance with the character of Beetlejuice between creepy but funny, not too creepy. Um, what was it like with the other sort of denizens of the afterlife, trying to find that balance with well, them? Um, Bob Short, who made all of our uh, prosthetics for us for all the other people in the afterlife, we were just given scenarios of like, we, you know, we went to Tim and said, what should we do? You want? He said, well, let's have a guy with, you know, got eaten by a shark and another guy with it. You know, anyway, we figured out all these different scenarios that would be really visible that you could see that they died from. And basically, that's kind of what we did. And then we just started doing tests of airbrushing. It was actually the first movie that um, airbrushing makeup had ever actually been used in a film. I think a little bit had been done in the movie Spaceballs just previous to that, because Steve had done a little bit in that. But um, this was the first film that had actually used extensive airbrushing on characters, because they were all airbrushed, all those characters. And um, that was kind of fun. So you know, they all had their little quirks about them. But they all had that Tim Burton aesthetic with the dark eyes and the, you know, which he loves. <laughs> So in addition to these sort of fantastical um, makeups, you were also doing um, the makeup for the more human characters. Can you talk a little bit about the process for them? Um, yeah, well, of course, you know, uh, the Maitlands had to be very, you know, middle America, you know, nothing special. So, and we wanted Gina to have a really fresh look, which she did already. She was such a pretty young girl. And, you know, uh, Alec was Alec. But we wanted, uh, <laughs> we wanted, uh, Winona to have a really special kind of, you know, back then there was no such thing as goth, but I wanted her to have this kind of aesthetic, this Tim aesthetic as well. So I uh, did my, you know, little version of that on her too. And just to give her a little something going on, you know, and she was so cute. When she walked into the makeup trailer, she had dirty blonde hair that was about down to here and it kind of had a wave in it. And she just looked like nothing. And within three hours, when she popped out of our trailer, she was a completely different human being. And she was just so wild, you know, to see the transformation from her. And unfortunately, back then, you know, we didn't take a lot of pictures of befores because we never realized how radical the, you know, the changes were going to be. So I literally have one Polaroid of Winona with her blonde hair. And I don't know of any other pictures that exist of what she looked like when she walked in, before she walked into the trailer. I'm sure her family has some, but I don't think the studio took any or anything, so... Mm -hmm. Kind of like I'm saving this one little <laughs> picture, you know, because it's like, wow, you know, who is that? This is sort of a sidetrack, but is documenting the transformation something that you try to do now? Um, or? You know, as makeup artists, when we, when we, you know, do these characters, we really do like to, you know, document all of it. And unfortunately, some actors don't want it documented. They don't want the, um, the magic to be given away, you know? Um, but a lot of times we've been fortunate enough where we will actually set up a camera and do a time lapse mm -hmm. of the makeup job being done, or we'll ha let the EPK crew come in and they will do a film, they will film the um, actual makeup being done. And that's, I have had that a couple of times, which is nice. I think I had it on Edward Scissorhands once and on Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, but I can't remember too many other films. And a lot of times you're in such a hurry, you just don't even think about it. You're just doing it and you're mm -hmm. done, you know? And it's like, oh shoot, we never took a picture of, we never did a blah, blah, blah. But like I said, a lot of times also the studios don't want you to do it. They mm -hmm. don't want to, anybody to see what you're doing. So that's kind of a bummer. But I, I know a lot of makeup artists that do get to do that. They put it in their contracts now. Oh, interesting. Especially if it's something really, you know, exciting. Uh, so you mentioned how the film was sort of the red-headed stepchild. Oh boy, were we. Um, and it also was a film with quite a low special <coughs> effects budget, right? Um, so I'm interested how budget sort of entered into the creative process um, for well, you. Well, like I said, for Michael, we just kind of 
winged it for him. Uh, but he was basically, we made the ball cap every day for him. Uh, the only budget we had was for a wig for him, and we only had one wig. And every time we dyed it, I thought, oh, this bloody thing is going to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, we, it lasted through the film. It barely, and it's still alive, actually, because the hairdresser, Yolanda Toussaint, just donated it to the Academy of Motion Pictures uh, Library, so, I mean, a museum. So it still exists. And um, she sent me pictures of it not too long ago because for the 30-year reunion at Monsterpalooza this year, I, uh, Steve and I actually did the Beetlejuice character. And uh, it was really fun because it was one of the guys that performs Beetlejuice up at Universal, and he's really good, so it was a blast. It was really fun. Um, but uh, we're, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you asking me about was? Uh, sort of how the budget constraints. Oh, the budget, yes. Well, um, there was, the, the budget was so tight that they had one person, Bob Short, who won the Oscar with us. He made all of the props and all of the makeups, which was kind of a pain in the butt. But um, so when it came time to hiring the makeup artist, I said, OK, well, Bob, let me get some makeup artists in here. He goes, no, no, I want to hire him because my guys that are making the stuff in the shop want to work on it, and they might, and I want to. So right away, that was kind of a major difficulty. But it turns out, you know, he wound up hiring all the guys I wanted anyway because there were so few of us that did it back then. He didn't have, many, he didn't have much choice. Um, but we had a very small budget, hence that's why they let him make everything because obviously his shop was already up and running, and he said, well, if you let me do everything, I'll do it really cheap. And that's what we got was really cheap. So um, half the time the effects didn't work. The, the carousel hat that came up out of the ground, poor Bob, we shot that three or four days in a row because every time he came up out of the ground, something else broke on it. And, but I guess we, we finally worked out the bugs and it finally worked on the last day. But um, it was really great watching Michael do that because there was basically no script for him. A lot of his dialogue was actually off the cuff and um, there was some, I wish to God I could see outtakes of this movie because <laughs> this man did some of the craziest I've ever seen. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, a lot of it's in the movie, but a lot of it's not, believe me. <laughs> I can't even remember all the stuff, but we were dying. I mean, like scenes like, there was so much funny stuff in that movie. We had so much fun. The scene where they're, you know, singing around the dinner table, I was hiding in the kitchen, which is that swinging door just off of the portholes. And my girlfriend, who's the hairdresser, she and I were in there laughing so hard because th it was so silly. They could hardly get through the take because Catherine, she would start doing that and start busting up laughing. So, I mean, it took like forever to shoot that scene because they were all dying. They were all <laughs> laughing so hard. They could hardly do it. But they finally got through that as well. But it was a lot of fun to work on that movie, needless to say. I mean, we were just, it was like, oh, let's go make a movie in the barn, <laughs> basically, you know. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it was a blast. No money, but we had a good time. We made do. We figured out stuff. Like I said, I used stuff from the hobby shop and whatever I could find. Mm. So you continued to work with Burton um, throughout your career, mm -hmm. winning your third Academy Award for your work on Ed Wood. Yep. Um, so how did your fruitful collaborative relationship develop with Tim Burton? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a fruitful collaboration. I don't know. <laughs> I think it was just, you know, he and I got along really well. And, you know, when you find somebody that does what you tell them to do without doing it, telling, having to tell you what to do, like he just hand, hands you a character and you know what he wants, mm -hmm. I think it's easy for him. And I just loved working with Tim because he was so quirky. And he pretty much, he would let you basically do what you wanted to do as long as you stayed within the confines of his world, you know? So that was always good, and, and you know he used Johnny a lot, so I had a really good rapport with Johnny, and that was very helpful. And um, as you can see in the film, he used Jeffrey Jones and Ed Wood, and he would use similar, you know, some of his actors would be repeated in many of his films, so that was kind of fun. It was kind of like a big family, you know? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I don't, fruitful collaboration? I don't know if that's what you call it, but it was, it was fun. Mm -hmm. My, the last film that I did with him was Sweeney Todd, in England, and then now he's done most of his films over there, so unfortunately, you know, the American technicians really can't go over there and work, so um, I haven't been working with him. Mm. But if he ever comes back here, I might give it a shot. I might come out of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so 
Also on the subject of your Academy Award wins, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about your work on Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, there's also quite a lot of prosthetic work involved in that film. Yeah, Mrs. Doubtfire was uh, probably one of the hardest films I did, not because the makeup was hard to do, but I had to do it 53 times. And believe me, that means you can't go out the night before and drink more than one glass of wine because the next day you gotta be sharp because every single one of those pieces had to go on in exactly the same place every day because if even one centimeter of his skin was showing through, he sweated profusely. And if, it, if there was a little piece of skin showing, it would, that sweat would just come popping right out of that thing. <laughs> and I'd be chasing it all day, trying to keep those edges stuck down. But they, the pieces were made to overlap like a few centimeters. So as long as everything overlapped and he was completely encased in the Pax paint underneath, it was pretty, I was pretty good to go. And then all the sweat went out the back. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Robin was, he was fantastic. I mean, I, uh, every time I see him, I cry practically. I don't want to start getting all foggy now. But um, he, was, he was absolutely wonderful to work with. He was great in the, as the character of Mrs. Doubtfire. And he had so much fun doing it, too. I mm -hmm. remember one time we were out on the street in San Francisco. And we're doing the scene where he's walking across the street and the guy grabs his purse. And I was standing on a corner with him. Um, I just touched his makeup up and we were get, getting ready to shoot. And you know, because you're out on the street, anybody can go walking around as you know, nobody knows what's going on as long as they get everybody out of the shot. So this young man walked up and he said, he tapped me, he says, Miss, he said, I hear Robin Williams is here today working. Is he here right now? And I, and I kind of went, um, uh, yeah, I, I saw him earlier. He's here somewhere. And Robin is standing right next to me. He just starts giggling because he thinks, this is so cool. Nobody knows I'm here. <laughs> but um, he, was, he was very cute. He was such a sweet, dear man. I, I miss him terribly. It seems like you probably develop pretty close relationships with a lot of the actors, maybe just because of the amount of time you spend Yeah, of course, makeup. and you, you have to think of being a makeup artist is a really intimate job. I mean, you're touching them, you're, you're right in their face, you know, you're in their space, you know? And yeah, you do create, you do, you know, curate these really nice friendships, you know? Even, you might not see them for like three years and you'll see them again, it's like, oh my God, you, you never left me, you know? Mm. It's, it's really kind of an interesting, the whole business is interesting that way because you could like be on a movie set and not see a, even another technician and it's like, oh my God, hey, how are you? You know, and you're like friends forever. So, I mean, <clears throat> the, the movie business is like no other business, I don't think. I mean, because you, you think about it, I, most of the movies I spent 16 hours a day on the set and that's because we get there two hours before everybody, we stay an hour afterwards, you have your lunch and they want to be shooting for 12 hours. So. That adds up to 16 hours. <laughs> so you are at work with these people longer than you are at home sleeping or with your family. And that's kind of one of the things I talk about all this time when I'm at school, because I also work with the school. And I tell you know these people, if, you know, don't plan on having a family that's gonna be too cohesive if you're gonna be working on, especially TV, they're even worse. But I, I digress again, we won't go into that. <laughs> I'm not at school right now. Well, not, not, not at my school. But, I mean, this is all very interesting. Um, why would you say maybe that TV is a lot harder than film work? Well, TV's harder because it goes on much longer. You know, you figure you have eight months a year, you're working on a TV show, and they have extremely long hours for everybody. I mean, a lot of times they work so long that they have to put people up in hotels because, you know, now we have this thing is you can't drive home if you've worked too many hours or if you have a short turnaround because too many people have gotten killed or injured in car accidents on the way home. So. Um, it, it's, it's just very difficult. I mean, you, everybody wonders why there's so many breakups in the movie business, and that is why, because they're never home. And working on a television show is the worst, because it's really long, long hours and longevity as far as, you know, being on a movie set with them. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if I could ask you about uh, your experience in front of the camera on TV. Um, <laughs> as one of the judges for the long running show Face Off. It was fun, I really enjoyed it. I, um, I think the first episode, the three of us were like absolutely terrified because <laughs> none of us, and like, you know, I mean, I had done a few interviews and stuff, but it wasn't like sitting out there and talking, you know, like go, pointing at people and having to judge people. It's like, I don't wanna tell them they have to go home, oh my God, <laughs> you know? 
And the, like, some of them we felt genuinely bad because some of them were so good and we didn't want to send them home, but you could only have one winner, you know? And um, I'm actually still friends with many of the kids that were on the show, and, and one of them's teaching at my school right now, and, and the, a couple of other ones come and go because they've done so well, you know, they're in, the, in the business now. Some of them are in, have gotten into the makeup union, and they're doing really well, so I'm really happy for them. We had some really, really talented makeup artists on that show. We had some super duds, too, but <laughs> <laughs> we had some really good ones. <laughs> mm. So I wonder if I can ask you, um, we're kind of in this era of intensifying use of digital effects, of uh -huh. CGI. So how do you see the future of special makeup effects work um, in this new era? Well, I got to tell you, and you know, everybody says, oh, is special makeup effects, are they going to go away because of CGI? No, because you know what? Actors like being in makeup. It makes, it makes them feel like the character that they're doing, like example. When we were doing uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, um, uh, Stellan Skarsgård played Bootstrap Bill. And Bootstrap Bill had a, his, his, because he was over three movies, as, as these movies progressed, his makeup or his being got more encrusted with all these different sea urchins and starfish and all these coral and all this stuff. And after the, he had went through eight stages. And after the third stage, he was not supposed to be a makeup anymore. He was supposed to go into the digital realm. And um, that would have been fine that we would have done. That would have been fine to do that. But he liked being in the makeup so much, he wanted us to continue doing the makeup on him. And I said, Stellan, it's going to get really heavy, you know, because you're going to have all this coral on your head. And you're going to have stuff on your shoulders. And he goes, that's OK. It'll just help me act like, he said, I'll be acting like I have all that stuff. It'll be, you know, useful. And what was so cool about the Pirates film is I worked really closely with John Knoll who was at ILM at the time, who did all of our characters, like the Davy Jones and all of his crew. And what he did was he took our real character, our bootstrap Bill character, and he fashioned all of his digital uh, characters after our makeup with the same texturing and look of it. So there, it was seamless. You couldn't tell the difference between a bootstrap Bill, who was a makeup, and the actual characters like Davy Jones and all of his guys. So that was a really cool thing. And, in, and of course, as we went on, uh, Bootstrap Bill's character had little digital effects added to him, too, little things spitting and stuff. So I think that there's, you know, there's always room for both in this world. And I, and I love the melding of the technology of having uh, digital effects on top of makeups, real makeups, because it just enhances them. And um, I did a film called AI which was one of the first films that I ever saw. Well, it's the first film that it ever was used on. They're, you're using it a lot now. But um, Stan Winston created this really cool effect of uh, removal. You know, it's easy to add on to a character, but it's hard to remove. And so we had a lot of those AIs had parts of their bodies missing and parts of their faces. And what he did was he created these really cool prosthetics that allowed you to remove the face so he had blue screen built into prosthetics that you applied to the face. So, the, so it was like a reverse technology. Instead of blending off a of makeup onto the face, you're blending this removal thing onto the face to remove this big chunk of skin here, or piece of this face. And it was really clever the way they did it. And we did it on probably at least eight of the AIs. And um, it was really hard trying to explain to the Academy about this new technology and makeup that he had developed. And they just all kind of got mad and just said, oh, no, it's all deep CGI. We don't want to know anything about it, blah, blah, blah. And, I could, and, and now, <laughs> now, <laughs> guess what, guys? <laughs> That's all we talk about now. <laughs> so um, you know, it's, just, it's a learning curve, you know, how all these things work. And, and little by little, you know, technology, you know, as as technology grows, our minds have to start getting opened up to these things and figuring out, OK, well, what's going to work? What isn't going to work? When is it necessary? How do we use it? Uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Is that a long, drawn out answer? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. So, so I'd like to ask you a little bit about how you got into uh, the makeup business. Um, so I believe you started in the underground music scene in LA. I, I kind of, I kind of did. Um, you have to understand. I knew I wanted to be a makeup artist when I was five years old, and my next door neighbor um, was a makeup man, and his daughter was my best friend from the time I was five until I was thirteen. 
And every Halloween, you know, I wanted to be a witch or a goblin or some creepy, nasty thing, and she always wanted to be a fairy or a princess or some little frilly thing, you know, I don't know why. But, um, and I always used to, I loved it. I just loved transforming the human body. And I used to say to him, oh, Mr. Latito, I want to do what you do when I grow up. And he'd go, yeah, sure, kid. And, and you got to understand, like, you guys don't realize this, but Previously to the 70s, there were no women makeup artists. I think there was two, and they were hidden in a back room. One of them did Marlena Dietrich, believe it or not. But there was like only two makeup women. The rest of the women that were in the makeup and hair department were, the, were either hairdressers or body makeup artists. And makeup was predominantly done by men. So as I said, he would just say, yeah, sure, kid. And my mother and father would always say, well, sorry, you can't do that for a living because you're not a guy. And, Anyway, you know, they moved away and we don't know them anymore and blah, 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 you're never going to get in. And I'm going, well, okay, fine, this is just, I don't know what I'm going to do then. Because, I mean, I, that's what I wanted to do. I always knew it, even through high school. And um, so I got out of high school and I thought, well, I don't want to go to college. Sorry, guys. I, I was going to try not to say that. But I just, my parents wanted to send me to Loyola Marymount, and I'd gone to Catholic girls' school all my life, and I was like, oh my God, if I have to do this again, I'm going to die. And I, I just said, you know what, can, can you just give it a break for a minute? Because I said, they're really not going to teach me anything I want to learn. And my mom just said, well, what do you want to learn? I said, I, I want to do, I want to work in the movies, I want to be a makeup artist, but you can't be a makeup artist because you're a girl. And I said, okay, well, whatever, just let's give it a break. So I, I decided, okay, I'll go to fashion merchandising school. Maybe I can be a costume designer, because costume designers are women. That's cool. I like making costumes, and I can do fun stuff that way. After I went to that school, I realized that they were all such backstabbing, hideous people that there was no way I was going to get involved with that group. So <laughs> maybe they weren't all that way, but they were that way where I was there. <laughs> um, so then um, I said, OK. And I had these fabulous gay friends. I used to go to all these flea markets all the time. And they had this really cool vintage clothing store called Glad Rags that was very successful. And back in the 70s, vintage clothing was really, really hot. You know, everybody wore 40s clothes and big fur coats and all these cool things and just bitching stuff, right? So they said, we're going to open up another store. Do you want to be a partner with me? I said, sure, I'll do that. So basically, I opened up this store with them. They did nothing. I did everything. So it was basically my store, which was really fun. And I had this vintage clothing store. And in the meantime, I had gotten married to a guy in the music business, a British guy. And he knew all these British rock and rollers. So I was hanging out with like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple and all these old rock and rollers that you guys probably don't even know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I would save certain vintage clothing items for different band members. And as they came to town, I would, you know, save them for them. I'd go give them to them, et cetera, et cetera. And then some local bands in town started wanting me to make, this is a really long answer, I know. <laughs> they wanted me to make some clothes for them. And there was this one crazy band that had, they were like space age, kind of like David Bowie people. And they wanted all these spacesuits and cool stuff. And they said, can you cut our hair and do makeup and stuff? And I said, yeah, I'll do it all. So I made their clothes. I cut their hair. I dyed their hair crazy colors gave them all these cool makeups, and they said, this is really cool, but we want big heads and pointed ears. And I said, OK, <laughs> I'm going to go find out how to make that stuff. And I tootled off to San Diego to a Star Trek convention, where I met, Star <laughs> where I met Fred Phillips, who was the makeup man from Star Trek, and some other people. And then I was walking around, and I saw these five guys walking around in Planet of the Apes makeups and full costumes looking totally perfect, like they stepped right out of the movie. And I went up to them, and I said, wow, you guys, where did you get those masks? And they looked at me really indignantly, and they said, these aren't masks. These are makeup. And I went, even better. Where did you get that makeup? And they said, well, we made it. And I said, that is so cool. Can you teach me how to do that? And they looked at each other and they said, but you're a girl. And I said, yeah, isn't it fabulous? <laughs> <laughs> and the long and the short of it was, they said, yeah, sure, come on up to Santa Barbara. <laughs> because 
because that's where this one guy lived and they made everything in their garage. So I was driving up to Santa Barbara every weekend to learn how to make these makeups. And um, of course I fell in love with one of the guys and you know how that goes. And then before you know it, we're living together. And before you know it, we're telling everybody we're married and we weren't. And before you know it, we're working on the movies. So uh, during this period, we're living you know, in, down in Los Angeles now. And you know, we were hanging out with Rick Baker in his garage and Rick could get jobs and he couldn't do them and he'd give them to us. And the guy that I fell in love with didn't like being on the set. He wasn't very sociable. He was more of a, you know, like hide in a room, sculpting, doing weird stuff. And um, so he, you know, taught me how to put on the makeup as best he could. And it turns out I was much better at it than he was because he didn't have the patience to blend in prosthetics that I did. So, I mean, Rick Baker used to kid us because he'd say, oh God, give it to V, she can blend in a dime to somebody's face. Because I was really meticulous. I wanted everything to be perfect. So that is how I started out. And, and then just went on from there. I just, you know, got one job after the other. And because like I said, there was literally, like you could count on one hand how many, even men in the makeup industry at that point knew how to do prosthetics. So. You know, any little weird jobs that came up, all of us kids, the five of us that there were, um, we got all the jobs and we just started doing them little by little. And then in 76, I think it was, 75 or 76, they had the union, um, Local 706, had to start letting people into the union because they didn't have enough members. So they had to, I guess it was a government thing, they had to open up the union. So what they did was they, um, said anybody that worked on a movie between this date and this date, if it went signator, in other words, like at the end of the movie or during the film, you know, the union went in and organized them. If they were on a film during that period for 30 days, you could get in the union and you didn't have to take the test. And guess what? I happened to be on a big old Western when that was going on that went signator. So I got into the union and um, that's how it all started. Amazing. That's a very cool story. <laughs> well, I'm curious, since you really just carved out a space for yourself in this very male-dominated, um, at that time, yeah. uh, field, over time, have, has it changed? Oh, yeah, it's changed a lot now. I mean, um, like I said, I, I, uh, I'm director of education at Cinema Makeup School. If any of you are ever interested in going to a makeup school, that's the school to go to. Um, and um, it, I would say it is... 90% women now. And a lot of the makeup effects artists that are out there now are, I mean, there's a lot of men doing it still, but there are a lot more women. I mean, I'm surprised every day at how many more women there are. And they're so good at it. I mean, especially we have students from China that are like so good that it blows my mind. I don't even know how they got that good because there's like nothing there for them basically. But some of them are such creative, uh, you know, painters and stuff, they can do anything. And when you let them loose on sculpting, oh my God, it's crazy. So yeah, we have a lot of very talented women now doing it. And a lot of them are on face off too. Very cool. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, I kind of want to ask you a selfish question okay. because it's one of my favorite films. Uh, but you mentioned Lost Boys um, yep. being the film you worked on right before Beetlejuice. Uh -huh. Got some other fans, Love that movie. it sounds like. My favorite movie, yeah! <laughs> so it has a lot of things in common with Beetlejuice, right? There's horror and comedy, there are these. Um, characters you've created that are monsters but don't appear primarily monsters, right? So I wondered if you could talk a little That's bit. That's because I like fantasy. <laughs> and um, when I, I had done a film with Joel Schumacher before I did Lost Boys, I did a film with Lily Tomlin called The Incredible Shrinking Woman. And uh, Rick Baker, by the way, was the gorilla in that movie, made the gorilla suit and was the gorilla. Um, and. Um, so Joel, you know, came to me and he says, I, I have this movie, I want, I want to do these, uh, you know, vampires and they're young boys. And I said, okay, Joel, this is my jam. You got to let me, you got to let me loose on this one, baby. <laughs> and I said, you know, I want them to be so sexy. I want every man and woman in that theater to want to go to bed with them. Bar none. 
And he said, okay. <laughs> and I said, you know, they've got to be, even when they turn, they've got to be sexy. You know, I don't want them to be, they can be scary, but it has to be a scary, sexy, scary. I don't know. I don't know how to more to, better describe it. And he said, okay. So he wanted Steve Johnson to do um, a test makeup. And I said, Steve's not going to do it. It's going to be awful. It's going to look like Fright Night. And we're going to have, you know, lots of teeth and horrific looking, you know, monsters. You guys see Fright Night, the first Fright Night? I know you did. You're old enough. <laughs> <laughs> but they were real scary looking. They were real monstery and... You know, I didn't want them to look like that. I wanted them to be sexy vampires, you know, because all girls want sexy vampires. Let's face it, right, girls? Yeah. What? So anyway, Joel said, OK. So he said, well, what do you want to do if Steve's not going to do it? And I said, my friend Greg Cannon is really cool. He's really young, and he's, he'll, he'll, he's got, I already talked to him about it. He knows what I want to see, and he's ready to do it. He said, OK, well, we'll do a test on Kiefer then. I said, OK, so we'll make him the most extreme one. So Steve Johnson did a test. It looked just like Fright Night. And then we did a test. And it looked just the way I wanted it to look. <laughs> and Joel said, OK, we'll hire that guy. <laughs> so that's kind of the short story about that. But um, yeah, I loved doing that movie. It was so much fun. The boys were so cute. The little Corys were so cute. We were up in you know, Santa Cruz. And it was just so much fun. And oh, it was just kooky. It was a blast. So I guess my last question. Um, to bring us back to Beetlejuice, I wonder He wasn't why... sexy. No. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think the film has had such an enduring legacy? And it's been adapted most recently into a Broadway musical. Um, Which also... they don't put the makeup on him or the hair. I don't know why, but OK, fine. Um, I think it's because he is such a wild and wacky character. I think people can identify with him because He's like the alter ego of everybody. You know, he just kind of does and says what everybody thinks but is afraid to say, you know? <laughs> and um, I think that's why his character is so successful at these theme parks, too, because people just love seeing this wacky character. I mean, and I mean, Michael's got to be just kind of, in a weird way, proud about it to see himself walking around this character that he created, because I tell you what, it wasn't on the paper. It was not in the script. I mean, that was completely Michael. I mean, that stuff was almost all of his dialogue was ad-libbed and so wild and fun. But I just think it's kind of like a, he's kind of a funny, you know, uh, I don't know. He's just, he's a wacky character that people like to see and they like to be around. And, and a perfect example is when we did that recreation of him at Monster Palooza last year and that guy did that character. It was like, oh my God, he was so good and so much fun. And it's just, he's just so wild. It's just... You just never, he says the unexpected, you know, and it's kind of fun to be around somebody that's like that and doesn't look like a real human being. It's not so much fun when they look like real human beings because then that's scary. But when he does it, it's not scary, it's funny. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight as we end this wonderful screening series on special effects. And I hope you'll join me in thanking V for being here with us tonight. Thank and being you for having generous. me. Beetlejuice, because I love them too. <laughs>